Welcome to the Gary Sutton Show here on WSBA. I am Gary Sutton, and great to be with you on a Wednesday morning, as we have got a lot to do today. We're going to be going all around the uh, the world, so to speak. And we start out this hour, I'll call with the doctors, because we've got Dr. Walter E. Williams and Dr. Terry Madonna right behind him, and all kinds of things to get at today. And we welcome this morning Dr. Walter E. Williams, who is a professor of economics at George Mason University, a columnist and author, a sit-in host for Rush Limbaugh, and I would say all, all around uh, best comment common sense person I think I've ever talked to. Good morning, Dr. Williams. How are you? And good morning, Gary. And, and my wife said this morning, I'm going to embarrass her very quickly, uh, that she would follow you anywhere. She thinks you are one of the most common sense guys in the country. So my wife said that, and I believe everything she says. So there you go. <laughs> Yeah, it pays to believe everything uh, your wife says. I, I, I understand that. And uh, <laughs> so anyway, I, I wanted to ask you an interesting question today, and I don't think I've ever asked you this in the years that we've talked. Um, if you were invited today to the White House, and you were invited to sit down and give an economics lesson to the president and, you know, maybe the cabinet even, um, what would be economics 101 from Dr. Walter Williams to the president and his cabinet? Well, first of all, I would not accept an invitation. <laughs> okay. All then, right. But, but theoretically. More, but more importantly, I think that one has to recognize is that uh, there's not much that can be explained, not much of what we see right. uh, in Washington can be explained by ignorance. Hmm. And because, uh, you know, ignorance is, is very optimistic because ignorance is curable by education. Now, what you what we do see in Washington is people serving their own interests. They 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 have an agenda. So uh, I can I can uh, talk myself blue in the face about the economic problems, and uh, and, and the politician will just uh, say to himself or say to me, "Well, yes, that's nice with economics, but I'm trying to get reelected, or I'm trying to get uh, uh, campaign contributions." So is that the, the explanation then why, you know, economics, history, lessons of the country from the past are, you know, they're apparent to us on Main Street, I think, in most cases, where we go out and we say, okay, we've got to solve problems today. I've got to figure out if I'm going to go on a vacation this year or not. Do I have enough money? Do I have enough disposable income? Mm -hmm. And yet our representatives don't look at it that way. And I guess it's easier when you're spending someone else's money, right? Well, they, 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 they want to get elected, and you're absolutely right. When the, the, best way to, the best way to waste money and have treats is when you're spending somebody else's money. And, and the thing, you know, for example, imagine the response I would get from, from uh, anybody in the White House, whether it was the Bush administration or the Obama administration, right. if I tell them, look, we've been a nation since 17, 1776, and we went our, our first 150 years, and there was nobody who thought that we should engage in, uh, in, 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 in managing the economy through various stimulus programs, government spending programs, until 1930, until the Hoover and the Roosevelt administrations. And you know, we ha somehow survived without uh, uh, the government getting involved with the economy. Now, what politician would find that in, that that message welcoming? Because his very job is to interfere with the economy. Yeah, and that's exactly it. And the, and the idea that government somehow knows better than you and I do in terms of making the economy authentic. Yeah, right. And matter of fact, the the kind of interesting thing is that when uh, you know we during this interval, 150 first 150 year interval in our in our society, uh, there were uh, depressions, there were recessions, and we got out of it. And when the government decided to come in and try to help a depression in the 1930s, it created the longest and the severest depression in our entire history. As a matter of fact, so much so that, uh, that President Roosevelt's uh, Secretary of Treasury, Henry Morgenthau, uh, he said to the president, he said, Mr. President, we've spent more money than we've ever spent before, and all that we have to show for it is higher debt. Wow. You know, it's interesting uh, when we talk about taxation, and maybe the big, first big defeat for the Constitution, I don't know, was the idea of the income tax, where Congress passed an income tax initially. A lot of people maybe aren't aware of this. Uh, and, the, and the Supreme Court said, no, no, that's unconstitutional. So what do they do? They make an amendment and say, well, it's unconstitutional except for this. And the 16th Amendment came about, did it not? That, that, that is absolutely right. Matter of fact, the Supreme Court uh, uh, threw out the uh, income tax on two occasions as unconstitutional. Exactly. And, and the reason why is that in the Constitution, uh, the framers 
feared a direct tax. That is, they, they said there should be no direct tax. That's in the Constitution. And the income tax is a direct tax. And the framers of our nation feared a, 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 a tax like the income tax. So they, what Congress had to do and what the Wilson and the, Thur- and the Roosevelt administrations uh, in the 19-teens had to do, they had to push through an amendment uh, to the, uh, to the uh, Constitution. And then a lot of people say that the amendment was not ratified properly. You know, one of the things I always get a kick out of is when I read the Constitution, Article 1, Section 8, and Paragraph 1, and it talks about, it says, uh, the Congress shall have the power to lay and collect taxes, duties, imposts, and excises to pay the debts and provide for the common defense and general welfare of the United States. Boy, are we doing that. But all duties, imposts, and excises shall be uniform throughout the United States. And, and I think about all the different taxes today when we talk about the taxes on the rich and so forth, and we say, well, that's not uniform, is it? No, and, and matter of fact, the the tax code is incomprehensible to uh, to, to geniuses. Yes, and and and, and it's and it's and it's incomparable, uh, in, in, incomprehensible to the very people at the IRS that's in charge of enforcing it. Well, it's got so many different piece, pieces and parts. And again, whenever I hear the government is going to try to. Um, Lord over something that is comprehensive. To be comprehensive has become the new four-letter word in government. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. And 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 the uh, and why the tax code is so complex is because Congress is in the business of creating special tax favors for some Americans that won't, that other Americans won't get, and so you get these reams and reams of of, uh, of pages because of all the favors that Congress is trying to do. Matter of fact, the two most powerful co- committees of Congress and, the, and that congressmen fight to get on is the House Ways and Means Committee and the Senate Finance Committee. Exactly. And these two committees are in charge of giving out tax favors for, 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 uh, for Americans in, in exchange for campaign contributions. Well, and again, the idea of politics is trumped all because you look at Obamacare, the number of exemptions and how they're handed out. It, it's just incredible when you see unions get in because unions vote generally for the party of the president. No, that's right. And 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 what the what the American people have come to accept is this massive power grab by the executive branch of government. That is, uh, uh, Obama is acting like a king. O- other presidents have acted that way, but uh, uh, Obama is acting all yeah, acting more like a king than anybody else. That is, he's saying, well, gee, here's a law that Congress passed. Let's say Obamacare. Well, I don't like this section of it. I don't like that section of it. So, so we're going to make an an, an, ex- an executive order to get rid of it. Well, here's an interesting piece that the president said just yesterday, Dr. Williams. I want you to hear it, and I kind of, you know, you're a prophet when it comes to this. Here we go. I can use that pen to sign executive orders uh, and take executive actions and administrative actions that move the ball forward uh, in helping to make sure our kids are getting the best education possible, making sure that uh, our businesses are getting the kind of support and help they need. I can do anything I want to with that pen because I don't like what that pesky Congress is doing, right? That, that is absolutely right. And, and in that particular case of edu- ed- education, uh, his administration is contributing to the uh, to the breakdown of education, particularly in Louisiana, where they have a voucher system going and where the uh, the Justice Department is coming down on it because they're saying it does not meet the uh, uh, the, the, the busing uh, requirements of, uh, of, of years and years ago. And then busing doesn't do anything for education. Yeah, uh, you know, and, but what's funny right now is Louisiana is actually making some improvements education-wise. I just heard this morning uh, the the country has like a 1.4 uh, an education of 1.4 GPA, uh, which is up a little bit, which is terrible. We're, I think we're out of the top 15 in the, in the world right now. But uh, Louisiana seems to be making some strides in that regard. Oh yeah, and it, and it's because and it's because of this uh, this voucher system and yeah. charter school system and some changes that the Louisiana government has, the government has made that that fly in the face of of, of, the, of the people in the Justice Department who think that uh, the the best way that uh, blacks can be educated is is for us to go around and capture a white kids to sit beside in class. <laughs> Let's go to a phone call here very quickly, Doctor Williams. We have Tom in York. Tom, go ahead. It's your turn to make the call with Doctor Williams. Good morning, gentlemen. Morning. I, uh, I I'd like to make three three things I'd like to have the doctor comment on, and if he doesn't have time, that's fine. But the one is the flat tax, its impact on Hong Kong economically and what it would do for this country if it would be so implemented. Secondly, when government money is spent properly, I look at the space program in China as having made major inroads, and the press does not do anything for it. 
And third, if you really want to try to get egalitarianism in this country, capitalism would be a much better way to go than government spending. And I want to thank both of you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it, Tom. Uh, you want to take a shot at that, Doctor? Well, I, I'll take a shot. At, at the flat tax, I, I, I think that the flat tax would be a very, very good idea. But I would never vote for a flat tax until we repealed the income tax. Right. Because if we, if we, had the, uh, if we somehow got a national sales tax, which is uh, the, what people are talking about, the flat tax, and if we did not repeal the income tax, we'd find ourselves with a national sales tax and an income tax. That is, we cannot trust these people in Washington. So I would never go along with a, a, a flat tax or a national sales tax until we got rid of the uh, income tax. Now, so far as the uh, China space program, I don't know. I don't know anything about yeah. it. Yeah, you know, but the the government spending. I want to, he raised a, an, an idea here. The, the government spending. What is proper government spending? I mean, we that that horse left the uh, corral a long time ago. But if we got it back in under the Walter Williams program, what would proper government spending be? Well, I can I, I, I tell you what improper government spending would right. be. Improper government spending would be where the government takes the income of one American and gives it to another American to whom it does not belong. Right. Now, and that is that is two thirds, three quarters of our budget. That is whether you're talking about farm programs, uh, business bailouts, food stamps, uh, et cetera, et cetera. All these other programs where the government is, where Congress takes the earnings of one American and gives it to another American to whom it does not belong. Now, there, now in Article One, Section Eight of the Constitution, they list the things that Congress shall, shall do, uh, spend money on. And one's national defense, the the court system. Uh, Post office, post roads, and things like that. Yeah, and they make 17 very specific things, as I recall. And, and then the 18th, they say, we're going to make sure we can carry them out with this 18th one that most people said is the elastic clause. We can stretch it anywhere we want to. That's not what it was there for, right? That, that is right. It only applied to those things that Congress is authorized to do. Now, you know, you look at the, right now, the, the biggest uh, conversation that people are having out there is we have this income gap now. We're talking about this income gap. And, and how do we narrow that up? How do we make sure that we have a level playing field? You know, I, I, I'm thinking where you started in life, where I started in life, we all start at different places. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to level up the income gap. Uh, do you think the income gap is a myth or is it something that is real in terms of one group taking away from another group from top to bottom? Well, no, there, 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 there are surely income differences, but we have to recognize that income is a result that is, income is a result of, uh, of producing something, uh, you know, or, or trying to produce things. And so the, the real task before us is try to make our fellow... We have a caller coming in here. we got Jesse in Shrewsbury. Jesse, you're on with Dr. Williams. Go ahead, Jesse. I'm first, I'm very honored to speak to Dr. Williams. He's one of my favorites. Well, and, good morning. Um, I, wonder, I, I wonder if there's some way that we could educate people that raising the minimum wage does nothing but cost um, a wages a price cycle, and the people at the bottom are still going to end up at the bottom. I can't. I can't have trouble trying to explain this to some of my friends. Well, well, I think I think. Well, Thank you, Jesse. I think that the intentions behind the minimum wage, raising the minimum wage law, yeah, it, it, they're, for the most part, they're good. Yes. But if we have to ask, what is the effect? And you see, the effect of the raising the minimum wage is say that people want to want to make the minimum wage ten dollars an hour. Well, what's the effect of it? Well, the uh, ten dollars $10 an hour tends to discriminate against a worker who is so unfortunate to so as to have skills that would enable him to produce only five dollars worth of value per hour. And so uh, and, and an employer would see it as a losing economic proposition to hire a person and pay him $10 an hour when he can only produce $5 worth of value an hour. And so you deny him employment. That is that if you could pay that person what he could produce, five, let's say $5 an hour, then he would get a job in the first place. Then he could learn, get on the job training and upgrade his skills and eventually earn a higher wage. And so that's the, the, the dominant effect of the minimum wage law, and you and it, and it discriminates against uh, and and the primary di people that it discriminates against are teenagers because they lack the experience and maturity of. A
adults, and particularly black teenagers, that not, not only share the, te- the attributes of teenagers in general, but they share the additional handicap of going to rotten schools and, and coming up from going, living in rotten neighborhoods and broken families. Dr. Williams, when you look at the, the, the different economic solutions that we hear in our country, for example, we hear the president say, let's glow, grow the middle class from the middle out. Or we hear about the minimums that we're trying to reach for, yeah. crawling into the middle class. I don't ever recall growing up, and I don't remember ever hearing anyone say when they grew up, Mom, I'm really aspiring to be in the middle class when I get older. I, I just don't remember that. Uh, your thoughts about those kinds of economic things that are being thrown around right now? Well, well it, it's, just, it's just plain nonsense. And, and, and it serves, the, you know, for people to talk this way, it serves a political agenda. Now, so far as the minimum wage of law is concerned, it's devastating effect or on teenagers. Yes. But I ask you, Gary, what what congressman or senator or president owes his office to the teenage vote? <laughs> None. I mean, and, and so if you, in the political arena, you dump on people who cannot dump back on you. Now, if they if they uh, did things that favored the teenager, well, that that would be against that would uh, work to the disadvantage of unions getting higher and higher wages, and 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 politicians do owe their seat to the union vote. Right, and you know, I, I was listening last week. The war on poverty. We celebrated the 50th anniversary of LBJ declaring a war on poverty. And yet, uh, one of the questions I raised was the idea that, okay, we had the war on poverty. Uh, you know, our poor in this country, supposedly, are, are, are richer than any poor in the rest of the world. Not supposedly, it is. But my point being, when you look at our cities, when you look at a lot of the economic uh, movement in our cities, we're talking about the same things now that we were talking about 50 years ago, are we not? Oh. To a large extent, yes. And we spent uh, anywhere between 12 and $13 trillion on the war on poverty at, any, at, at, at federal, state, and local levels. And let me just tell you what 12 or $13 trillion could buy. It could buy all of the ships built in the United States. It could buy all the trucks and cars built. It could buy all of the office buildings in the United States. You could also wipe out a good part of our national debt, too, but that's another day. <laughs> that is absolutely right. As you look at the new head of the Fed, uh, Janet Yellen, uh, here's a question. I, you and I talked about this before, and I still remember your answer, and I thought it was brilliant. When should quantitative easing end, and what will happen in the short or long term when it does? I, I think, as I recall, you called quantitative easing counterfeiting. Yeah, <laughs> and counterfeiting. But see, I, 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 see, you can't say anything about uh, Janet Yellen, because if you criticize her, it's going to be called a war on women. <laughs> Okay. All right. If we take, let, let's go back and say Ben Bernanke, even though she's in now, we'll, we'll have a war on men. But, you know, the, the quantitative easing, we, we, we hear people say, well, the quantitative easing should end when the economy is strong enough. When will the economy be strong enough to end this influx of phony money? It, it'll be it'll be strong enough. Uh, I, I I'm I'm not sure, but it, what they 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 must they will have to do it when we face inflation rates around fifteen and twenty percent. Well, now people sit back and consistently say, okay, well the stock market looks good, that's doing well, and uh, but but the stock market and real life on Main Street. I mean, there seems to be an obvious disconnect. Well, you know, I think that what quantitative easing has done what the you know, the action of the feds buying all these equities uh, it has it has pumped up the stock market to a level that is never seen before it has benefited enormously people are in the stock market but it has not benefited enormously the average American, uh, you know, who wants to get a loan, who wants to uh, uh, start a business. Uh, it, it hasn't done very much. It hasn't done very much for the uh, for the unemployment in our country. As a matter of fact, uh, you hear people say they, they, they say, oh, well, we're lowering the unemployment rate. Well, they don't include the people who are not in the labor market. And, and, and today we have the highest number of Americans, 92 million Americans over age 16 are not – between 16 and 65 who are not in the labor market. Yeah, which is a real crime. Final question for you, Dr. Williams. Um, I often say it's a job of the government, a uh, job of our society, uh, the leaders in our society, to not level the playing field, but to remove as many question marks as they humanly can so that we can budget, we can work out here, we can do all the authentic work and trading and, and buying and selling. Uh, seems like there's still a lot of question marks for people out on Main Street. Yeah, well, well, we could do it if we would obey the United States Constitution. 
Yep, I, I, I couldn't agree with you more. And that's what made us a rich country in the first place. And somewhere in my mind, I keep thinking our leaders think that the United States Constitution has become somewhat obsolete, even though they swear to uphold it. That's right. <laughs> Dr. Williams, it's always a pleasure having you. We look forward to our next conversation very soon. Thank you. Thank you. Take care and have a great day. Dr. Walter E. Williams with us here on the Morning News on WSBA. We'll be back with yet another doctor, Terry Madonna, at 935. Here on the Gary Sutton Show on WSBA.